Hey, hello, everybody. Welcome to TL's Roadhouse. Special guest, Mr. Brandley Gilbert in the house, son. Hello, brother. Good hello, to see man. you. Good to see him. I've really been looking forward to this. We've uh, kind of met in passing a couple times, but you and I have never had a chance to sit down and talk, and you're a pretty interesting cat, man. I appreciate it. I think as a cop. I think musically and just the journey that you've been on, I mean, it's uh, it's been pretty impressive, man. You've kind of made your own mark, done your own thing. Uh, you're about the only guy I know in country that's carrying a double kick drum drummer out on the road. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> is he is he doing it? Oh, yeah, yeah. He is. Yeah. He's a trip, man. And I got to tell you, it's an honor to be here. I mean, I've, I've been a, a fan for as long Thank as you. I can remember. So I, I appreciate you having me, man. I've been looking forward to it, too. Absolutely, man. You know, there's so many people in the industry that, uh, you know, everybody's found kind of their own path. And I think that's one of the greatest things about country music is that uh, it's kind of uh, the melting pot of a little bit of everything. In my era, man, it was Western swing and shuffles with a little bit of jazz and blues. And now as we've moved into the last, you know, 10, 20 years or so, it's blossomed into rap influence and hip hop influence and all these other things, man. It's, it's pretty fascinating to see guys like Jelly Roll have success that they have had that, that that, you know, if you go back 20 years, would, would he have even had a chance of getting a record deal in the 90s? Oh, no, they didn't no, run him out. No way, man. You know, and guys like Colt Ford, which I've had on the show, I love Colt, man. So it's uh, it's pretty amazing that, that guys can come in. I think the talent, as long as you've got the talent and the passion, that to me is the most important thing. And what you, the rest of it, what you do with it, man, that's all up to you and what your vision of what music is and being satisfied with yourself, man. Absolutely. That's pretty freaking cool. I've always felt like, man, you know, when when it comes to country music, like, I don't know that there's a PhD or anybody that could define actually what it is. To me, it was always, you know, I always felt like songs that I wrote were country because that's that's the only life I knew. I didn't, I've never written a song about something I didn't understand or yeah. or been been through. So they all ended up country, you know, to me. Um, but like you said, I, I respect somebody's passion and. and you know, the want to do something like that. You mentioned Colt and, and Jelly Roll. You know, you, you run into a lot of people saying, you know, this this rap and country, them boys ain't country, this, that, and other. I can promise you, I'm, I, I should probably ask him before I tell this story, but I won't. Just to defend Jelly Roll, you know, this guy, we were shooting a music video for Son of the Dirty South. Yeah. And he needed to, uh, he needed to excuse himself, and there wasn't a bathroom on the premises. So this trucker stacked up like three spare tires and shit in the woods. <laughs> I'm telling you, if that ain't country, <laughs> I'll kiss your I'll ass. Kiss your ass, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and Colt goes without saying, you know, uh, he, he grew up right there by me. And I got to say, man, Colt's one of those that, you know, if it weren't for guys like that kicking down the door, you know, would you see a jelly roll? You know, would you would you see a lot of, lot of guys that you've seen in the business? Had it not been for Colt being told no. So many times, I don't know that any, you know, a lot of these guys would have gotten a yes, me included. Yeah, and it's fascinating to me, too, uh, a lot of guys. I didn't go the independent route. I mean, I, I kind of fell into that at the end, of at, after my, my record label time. A lot of these guys have had massive success independently, I mean, with with social media and, and kind of uh, blossomed that into record deals. I mean, it's kind of been a backward path than, than the way we experienced things years ago. The whole music industry's changed. It's completely different than it was when I first started out. Well, how, did, how did you get your record deal? I mean, honestly, we, uh, so I started out with a, a playing shows with, you know, at first it was this little cover band that I met up with in my hometown and uh, I told my parents I was out playing, you know, Christian conventions and stuff, and I'd go out and play with him. And when they'd take a, a set break, you know, it was one of those bands that played for like five, six hours. Yeah. You know, they'd take a break, and I'd play some of my songs. Well, um, when I, around the age I was 16 or 17, I met a guy named Corey Smith in my hometown, and he'll forever be, you know, one of my main influences in songwriting. Between him and Skinner, they showed me it was all I had to write about home. And, you know, that even though you write about things that are close to the chest, and it's, especially for him, you know, he was writing about my home. We were from the same place. Yeah. I remember hearing those songs and, and being like, man, that resonates on another level. You know, and, and he uh, he's just a special guy. I, I ran into him. I, I was in the process of getting kicked out of the first bar we ever had in my town. You know, after they allowed us to build a bar, you know, I was, I was on my way to get kicked out. And, again, I was 16, so I didn't have any business in there. And uh, I went and toured, you know, college markets with him. 
he kept me from getting kicked out that night, let me play a couple songs. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll forever love and appreciate Corey, man. It's, I, don't, I don't know if you've been exposed to him much. But I haven't. He's an amazing guy, man. He really is. He's he's, he's, he's just a special cat. But um, he, uh, he kind of took me around and started playing college markets. And uh, to be honest with you, I, I never saw music. I didn't think he'd be something, you know, I'd – blew up at it got i didn't think i'd be on a national stage and yeah you know but he showed me that i remember the day he was able to quit his job teaching and do music full time and i thought well that's kind of cool you mean i don't have to do illegal shit to make ends meet i, I can i can do music you mean all right let's do it you know you mean selling, uh, stealing hubcaps? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> spare tires, <laughs> things nobody needed, you know. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I remember that and, and having the idea, like, man, if if I could sell out, and he had this goal, he was like, he wanted to sell out the Georgia Theater, which is twenty minutes from our house, and and uh, you know, it's right there where the University of Georgia is. Yep. And I think back then it, it held a little more than, or now it holds a little more than it did back then. I think it was like six hundred, seven hundred cap and i remember when he did it and it was such a moment of pride for him and it kind of became a dream of mine and uh you know i, I didn't see it happening anytime soon it happened a lot sooner than um than i imagined and you know from there we kind of started branching out and hitting some of the same markets that we did with him acoustically with a band um it's always felt like our sound was more you know it's just I, I wanted a little more you know what i mean i, I wanted to play a rock show yeah you know, so we'd, we'd circle back with a band and, you know, through the years, it was kind of more about being self-sustainable and, and kind of not being in a situation where anybody could tell me no, you know, and, and kind of doing everything on our terms. And I, I made a kind of deal within myself that I was like, I'm not playing Nashville until I know I can sell the some bitch out. And when I go, play, when I play Nashville, I, I want to be an independent artist. I want to show up and. And I want to sell something out. If somebody wants to come see us, we're not doing a showcase. They can come to that show. Gotcha. And we went to the exit in and and sold it out. And and, and I'll never forget that. It was uh, it was something I'll never forget. Um, and then after that, Scott Borchetta was at that show. Uh, we had a distribution deal at the time with with Average Joe's Colts yep. label. Um, Scott Borchetta came to that show and and checked it out, and he came to the bus afterwards and you know, offered us a deal and. I was obviously kind of standoffish um, just because I'd heard horror stories about, you know, record deals and this, that, and the other. So, and I wasn't really practiced up on any of it. I didn't know any of the legal verbiage and, and any of that. So the first thing I did before I really hired a, a true manager was hired a business manager. That's probably <laughs> was, a good thing right yeah, there. It's like, I won't blow all my money. I've never had money before. What do you do with it? <laughs> <laughs> so he, uh, we we signed the deal. We ended up working out a deal with him, and uh, man, I've I've been with him ever since. It'll be you know fourteen years next year. I had I had the opportunity to spend some time with Borchetta when he was over at DreamWorks. You know, my time with Stroud over there. Scott's one of the most brilliant record people that I ever met, and the man uh, when it came to working a song at radio, there was nobody any better than him. His relationship and his knowledge of the business and his sense of timing about you know what you needed to release and when you needed to release it and how it fit in. I mean, he's, he was just, he's one of those guys that was really brilliant at what he did. I agree. And, and you know, coming from a promoting background doesn't hurt either. Yeah. He, but he's also one of those guys that, that if you get a little sideways with him, he can kill your record faster than anybody in town. <laughs> you ain't shit. I tell you, I just had a recent experience. Uh, I, was, uh, I got told no for the first time in 13 uh -huh. years. Uh, there was a song that I was working on with uh, a guy named Adam Calhoun and a guy named Tom McDonald. Uh, and it was called Your America. I was, man, I was really excited about it. It was, you know, it said some things that um, that I level with and, you know, they're like-minded dudes. And it just, uh, I mean, in hindsight, looking back at it, I, I get their point, but at the same time, um, I felt like, you know, at the current climate of society, it, it was something I was not ashamed at all to be a part of. 
yeah. Um, that's pretty frustrating as an artist when you get your hand slapped like that, too. Uh, I mean, it's uh, that's one of the bad things about being on a major label, uh, and especially with the climate out there right now, with all the woke culture, culture and all that crap going on, man. Yeah. You know, corporations have taken over the freaking world, and, you know, I know the thing, the whole Bud Light deal, man, watching all that crap go down, it just it just pisses you off. It's like, when is this going to come to an end? When are people going to have enough with what they see out there? And and having your voice squished, but, I mean, I, I look, I see so much of it going on around. I mean, look at the NFL, man. They have those guys so clamped down. If you play in the NFL, you can't say anything. Yeah. You're forced to to brand the products that they tell you. I mean, you can't wear Beats. You got to wear the certain kind of headphone. I mean, they're very heavy handed. I don't. I haven't been on a major in so long. Is it similar to that at this point? Um, I can honestly say my my experience there with, with him with that label has always been more of a partnership than it has been an employer yeah. employer employee relationship. This was this was the first time that legitimately in thirteen years things are awful polarizing out there right now. You know, yeah. and and we all have very strong opinions. And I can I can see as as somebody that's run a small business and been on the other side of it trying to try to figure out how to straddle the fence sometimes. You have to uh, kind of step back and take a look at the bigger picture and kind of figure out what is the best thing in the interest of your career. And as an artist, that's really hard to do when you when you feel like your voice and your music and the lyrics and the things that you say are part of who you are, and you you're very proud of that. I respect that a lot. But it's a it's a tough it's a tough fence to straddle, for sure, for sure. And I guess that's why we have people in place to help us do that. <laughs> I, I was I was all in on it, and, and to be honest with you, I mean. They probably wouldn't appreciate appreciate me saying this, but had I been an independent artist, I would have 100% put that song out. Now, I know a little bit about Tom. Tom's pretty controversial. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know uh, John Rich had that thing that came out with him uh, back last year, uh, and I guess that's but I, that's part of his whole stick. Yeah, you know, I, I respect Tom. I, I like Tom, and I've got a, a deep respect for Adam Calhoun, too. And, and you know, they, they both kind of, They'll raise some hairs on some people and, and have some people fired up, but, you know, at the same time, is that a bad thing? But it goes back to what I said early on as an artist that appreciates artists, whether I have a personal like or dislike for the music or the content of what they say, I still respect the craft and I still respect people that love the craft for whatever their, their platform is. I still have a lot of respect for that. Absolutely. And I wish more people could see that because... Uh, I think we get a lot of pushback and I would even say a lot of hate from, from the other side of the aisle. And I don't feel like most of us project that back out. I mean, I, I'm a live and let live kind of guy, but don't get in my way. I'm not, not going to tell you how to live your life. Man, you know what? I, I feel like most of the people that I'm going out on a limb here, but I, <laughs> I feel like m most of the people that, that I, I know well and respect their opinion and, and value who they are as humans, most of us kind of ride more to the middle than we'd like to think. There's just Absolutely. a couple issues that send us left or right. You yeah. know, we have more in common than, than I think I think we forget how much we have in common. You know, and, and these people need division to, you know, to have a winner and a loser. And sometimes I think they fight for just for the sake of fighting because they're they're arguing about things. And half the time I don't even think they understand what the side of the fence they're on. They're just mm -hmm. they're yeah. just making noise to make noise. And and a lot of it is just it's like stop enough's enough. Yeah. Uh, I, and you know, I grew up in a small town, probably just like you did, man. Dry County, man, the Oklahoma line was seven minutes away, depending on how fast you drove. You know, and, and if you were old enough to get your money on the counter, I mean, we were we were drinking on a regular basis at 14 because all there was to do is drink beer and ride a gravel road. There was nothing else back there. Absolutely. You know, so that's the culture that I grew up in. And it's just, uh, but, but people helped each other. You know, everybody went to church on Sunday morning, no matter what you did on Saturday night. Absolutely. You know, that was just the culture that we grew up in. And I, I think we've lost a lot of that Americana feel. I'd sure love to see us get back to that you ain't kidding and I, I do think there's a lot of work too to what you said about somebody who's willing to kind of speak about that and, and use their art to do so like i'll never forget we were playing willie's picnic one year and it was when uh you know christopherson had just started dealing with some of their stuff and i usually yeah. don't don't say his name because it was off the record and but he said something and i'll, I'll never forget that he you know he did a, an interview with you know the radio station there and afterwards can't, I don't remember who it was, but somebody, you know, had asked him, said, hey, man, I got a question for you off the record. He said, what do you think about these 
these new artists using these social media platforms to be political. And I'll never forget, it was, it was you know, he said, I can't speak negatively to it. He said, because, you know, I, I was one of those that kind of wore my politics on my sleeve. He said, but I think there's something special about an artist who's willing to use their craft to do it. Like if you're a singer, I, you know, sing a song about it. If you're a songwriter, write a song about it. And, you know, I, I just, I remember thinking like, how much power is it? How much power is there in music? You know, it's, it's, I think we forget that sometimes. It's like having a voice is one thing. You know, if there but, wasn't if there wasn't that much power in music, every politician wouldn't be trying to attach themselves to the hip of music artists. Absolutely, because we bring we we have the ability to uh, affect cultural change, uh, to bring awareness to certain situations, uh, to provide uh, a lens into things that may people may not be looking at. I mean, that's the power of writing and performing songs, and it's Absolutely. a powerful thing. Yeah, you ain't kidding, buddy. But yeah, I do think, you know, and you said cultural. I feel like a lot of the differences we have are cultural. There was a, I won't say what publication it was, but they uh, they kind of had, they put my back on the wall a, a little bit. So there was a, a magazine, or, or they were working on an article called Country Music and Guns. And I remember sitting down with a guy, and they basically said, hey, we've we've got pictures of your tattoo. I've got the Second Amendment tattoo across the hole on my back. And, uh, you know, we're going to, you know, it's, it's pretty much a free narrative at this point. He can do the interview or we're going to post a picture and control the narrative ourselves. And I remember taking the interview and, and first thing I asked the guy, you know, was like, Hey man, can we both just agree before we start this conversation that this is, this is more of a cultural thing than, it, than anything. Like I said, do you, you like country music? And he said, no. All right. Well, how do you feel about guns? He said, I've never seen one in real life. It was like, let me show you this one right here. Yeah, no shit. Like, <laughs> um, and, and I remember telling the guy and telling my post at the time, like, hey, you know, just for the record, I'll, I'll skip some of the details of that conversation because it was one of those where management was on the line and they'd hit a button, you know, if they wanted me to to kind of hit the brakes on what I was talking. Man, they hit that button more times. It was almost a just. So it wasn't a sit style. down face to face thing. You're doing I was over Zoom. Phone. Yeah, I got you. Okay. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd get into certain things and. You know, I just remember thinking, what, what is a guy who hates country music who's never seen a gun doing writing this article? You know, and I don't think they used any of our conversation whatsoever when it finally did come out because I told my publicist, she was friends with, with the editor, or one of the editors, I said, uh, you know, I want to give them a heads up and just let them know, you know, by putting this article out, they're selling more guns than I could if I were to go on every social media platform I have and tell somebody to go buy one. You know, it's, it's, but, you know, I, I will say this too, you know, with, with social media effectively turning the entire world into a small town, you know, it, it's, you know, it's a, it's a cultural thing entirely, but it, it, you know, you were talking about, it's a lot different music business, is a lot different now than when you came up. Hell, it's, it's a lot different now than when I came up, we, we were still able to come up playing small bars and. Well, and, and cut your teeth and develop your craft and Absolutely. instead of going and sing karaoke, you know, two or three times a week. And then all of a sudden you got a deal and you've got to figure out how to put a show together. We learned how to do the craft. Absolutely. And it's like, you know, watching, you know, social media do what it does. I think, you know, for me, I, people laugh and joke at me, but I, I have a stint during the show where I tell people I don't have the passwords to any of my social media accounts, and I, I know they all think I'm kidding, but I really don't. Like, I'm a liability. I can't, they don't trust me with them. And my manager sit right there. He'll tell you, they, they don't give me them some bitches. I don't have them either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my manager's sitting right there. They don't give them me either. Yeah, I tried Twitter a few years ago for just a little while, and I can't tell you how many fights I got into with people. I was so, I stayed pissed off all the time. It's like, I'm not doing this. Yeah. This it, is a marketing tool, and I'm not doing this. Outside of being used for business, I, you know, I've struggled to see the benefits of, of it, you know, in a family life or even in your personal life. It's like, you know, I mean, these people control the narrative and the algorithm, and it's kind of. I like I like being a little anonymous. <laughs> yeah, no joke. But it's it's like you know there is no face to face. You know, you you kind of just you know go unchecked. There's no accountability. You know, you, people say things, get away with saying things they w wouldn't say in person. I wouldn't say to your face. No, they'll absolutely. hide in mom and daddy's basement and be keyboard warrior and act yeah. like they're the toughest guy on the block. 
Exactly. And that, that, there's a fundamental problem with that to me. And there's no accountability. Well, you know, I grew up in a little town. There was a town of 1,100 people. I graduated in the largest class that ever came out of the school. We had 49 graduating seniors. There were 52 of us, so obviously three didn't make it. I think they'd probably been there two or three times already. <laughs> uh, but, we, I mean, the opening day of deer season, we got the first day of deer season off. We carried guns in our vehicles. I had a gun in my vehicle. I carried a pocket knife in my, in my pocket to school all the time. It was no big thing. Yeah. You know, that was just part of the culture. Everybody talked about it. I mean, it was, it, there was no big thing. Uh, I didn't grow up in a town. You know, Daddy didn't have the guns locked up in the house, but I knew if I touched his guns, he'd whoop my butt because they were loaded in yeah. the house that I grew up in. There were certain guns that I was allowed to have access to if I wanted to go squirrel hunting or I wanted to go deer hunting. The rest of it was off limits unless I was with him and he allowed me to do it till he taught me how to shoot them. But you had to grow up with an appreciation and learn some lessons and, and, and be a part of that culture. I mean, I grew up around it. I don't understand how people can pass judgment on something they don't understand. Yeah. You know, uh, it, it, we live in a society, this country is based on the Second Amendment. You take that away, this country is going to fall apart. That's yeah. my personal opinion. I mean, if, you know, I, was, I saw a thing the other day, this guy was talking about, what are the two major things that that we have that other countries don't? You know, if it, you know, if you were to take away the, the minuscule things, what are the two big things that we have that that divide our freedom from, you know, the rest of the free world. And it is the first and second, and the second protects the first. It, well, most of the people, the criminals that have guns in this country were provided by the CIA, so you take the <laughs> law-abiding citizens away. <laughs> Here we go. Now we're getting into fucking weeds. Come on. Let's go. You know. You know. Yeah. I mean, that's documented. We know. I mean, yeah. it's just part of it. And, and you know what, man, on, on that end, I feel like, they're always going to have them, you know, those of us. And they have their agenda and their purpose for doing what they do and why they do it. I mean, I don't understand all of it and really don't care to. That's that's a fair point. And, you know, I, I look at it, a, a lot of the things that, that are talked about on social media, and you see how, how just invested these people are. And it's like, you know, you wonder why a lot of the things around you are going to shit. If you were to put half the time into your home or into your church or into, into your community, that you put into social media and, and trolling motherfuckers on there, man, it'd be an entirely different world. It'd be an entirely different life. I, I don't think we'd all be loaded guns walking around. You know, uh, Chris Young is a good friend of mine, and I'm sure you've seen the video of stuff that happened a few months back uh, about him getting, you know, kind of attacked by the cop downtown and all that stuff. I didn't I didn't ever get the story behind that. Uh, it was it was pretty unjustified, you know. It's, uh, I think... Uh, there's kind of uh, things that are out of control. I have a lot of respect for law enforcement. There's good guys out there. I know a lot of them. I'm friends with a lot of them that are good, honest, decent people that, that believe in right and wrong, that are trying to do good things in the community. And then there's guys that are on power trips. Yeah, and sure. uh, it's it, it can be a little scary. I'm, I've known some of those guys, too. I've been friends with some of them. I've seen them do some things that were very questionable to me. Yeah. You know, I, I just it it's it's a scary time that we live in and cultural things and you know, it's, I, I, I just don't know, man. I, I don't know how we get back. My point being is, is as I see things like that, I kind of want to go back to Mayberry and think about Andy Griffith, man. What happened to the guy that could come in and defuse a situation that didn't need to have a gun, that didn't need to assault somebody or yeah. go on a power trip? There, Can't we get back to having conversations? Well, that, that's the whole thing right there. You just said a lot of it. We can't communicate. No, we're not. Communicate. We're pre-programmed to be defensive and, and, and fight. Any, anytime there's a, you know, a challenge and topic of conversation we're already guarded we're loaded because you're either right or you're left yeah you know, there's and there's more middle ground than we remember I, I i i truly do feel like that like you know if, if you were to take away a couple really divisive factors like personally there's some things about the left that i don't mind like i really like pot i you know if the republicans give me my pot and the Democrats give me my guns. I'm not real sure I'd really give a fuck. Well, well Hootie, go call, let's call Hootie. He's got it. <laughs> I'll probably have to edit that out. I mean, Hell no, that's, yeah, that's pretty well funny. Said. Well said. So, so think about this. So uh, I don't. I don't. I'm not going to go down the race rabbit hole, but I am going to make this point because I. I 
I respect anybody that works hard and wants to take care of their family. I don't I don't particularly see race or religion or, or any of that crap. None of that's relevant to me. With your sexual orientation, I don't care about any of that. I respect Denzel Washington, man. What a brilliant actor. I think he's a decent man. And I was I was watching an interview that he was doing. Uh, it's been a while back. But he said the difference, in a, it's a cultural thing. He was talking about a specific director that directed a movie that he was in and how this other director of the, the, uh, the, the movie company was trying to force this other director. And he said, it's a cultural thing. He said, when it comes to black people, it's not about race. It's not about that. He said, but when I stick a, a comb in the back of my pocket, he said, there's something I can smell the smell of the oil in my hair and the way it feels. He said, there's cultural things that we identify with that if you don't live the life, you can't understand it. It's not race. It's not religion. It's a cultural thing. Yeah. And people have got to start realizing that. All the stuff that the media keeps feeding us, creating all this animosity and all this this controversy, that's not what this is about. We need, to, we need to wake up and realize what's going on around us. They're fueling all this stuff. The sooner we can mm-hmm. wake up and back out and realize, I'm not going to play, I'm not going to play into your crap anymore, I think we can diffuse a lot of this stuff. I oh, really absolutely. believe we could if we will all get our head out of our ass. That's, that's, that's the thing, though. You know, it's like the united we stand, divided we fall. Like we forget so easy. And I say we because, you know, there's I feel a certain way about certain topics, and when they come up, I don't think twice about sharing my opinion on them. Yeah. Um, you know, I feel like all of us are geared that way to a certain extent. But I got a song um, coming out on, on the album we're working on right now. It's called Me and My House. And, and, you know, my approach to a lot of things changed when I had kids. And to, to be completely honest, I started caring about things that I really hadn't paid much attention to in the past. Yeah. You know, just to be brutally honest. Um, you know, <laughs> and the song basically talks about, you know, I heard they took you out of schools and you ain't in the pledge no more. You know, you're against the rules, and I know you've heard that before. Uh, next to be the courtroom, quarters and dollar bills. It's like talking about, you know, that we're, we're taking God out of the picture, man. I, I do feel like there was there was a certain aspect of this country that, you know, I feel like we're losing a little bit that's under attack. It's like, man, <laughs> you, you want to get us back to Mayberry, you want to get us back to the, the good days, man, give it back to God. Because yeah. every little bit of it you take away from him. And, I, you know, I know that's weird coming from me because I cuss like a sailor. But I, you know how it is. I've been on the road for 20 years. It's like. It's a cultural thing. It's a cultural <laughs> thing. We're talking about culture today. <laughs> We're some cultural motherfuckers in here. Do not get it twisted. <laughs> I'm, I'm st- Dude, so. <laughs> Uh, I got I got to share this with you too. I'd, uh, we'd gone to uh, uh, CRS. It was last year, and so Jelly Roll was on the, the radio seminar on the New Faces show, and and so my mom's with me, and my manager's with me, and everything. My wife's down there with me, and and Jelly Roll gets up there, and I mean he's he's getting on his soapbox and preaching a little bit, and then he's throwing some MS out there and doing all this other stuff. As my mama's, my mom was like, her eyes get about this bigger. And my mama's 80, and she reads her Bible every day. <laughs> and then he comes off the stage and comes over and hugs my neck, and we have a little moment and everything. My mom's just like, what in the hell is going on? <laughs> it's a cultural thing. Well, you're you know, running with, Tracy. But, but golly, I mean, look at the journey. I mean, never you got to understand what somebody goes through in life. He's been through a journey. He's been through his own hell, man. And you got to respect the fight that he's fought to get where he's at and and for each and every one of us in our own path because every journey through this thing's different every path is different absolutely i i will say this though that one that one's on another level yes sir i got a lot of respect for that dude for for a lot of reasons one he's the same dude every time you meet him you just said like you know what i'm saying he's unapologetic about being who he is yep and I have a deep appreciation for that, especially in this world, because we got some chameleons, man. Oh, yeah. That can fit in in any, not only any environment, but any conversation can tell you exactly what you want to hear, turn the corner and, and, and say some other shit. You don't have to worry about that with that guy. No, he's solid. It's the same thing every time. And, and the things that he's been through, you know, obviously we all have the worst experience. We all have a rock bottom, right? We all have the worst experience in our life, and I feel like everything's relative. But his rock bottom is is one that not many people make it out of just to, you know, integrate back into society, let alone to break, you know, as an artist, let alone to break as an artist at 38 years old. Yeah. When was the last time you heard of somebody break? And this is not, I love the man to death. I love him with my whole heart. So, brother, if you hear this, I'm not talking shit about you, but... 
you know, back in the day, it was it was about having a half decent voice and a pretty face. Mm-hmm. You know, this dude's got tattoos all over. It. You, you, if you'd have told me that guy, he'd have showed up in Nashville ten years ago. You know, he had to break through some serious barriers. And I do think, you know, you have your Colts and, you know, those of us that were outside of the box, man. I like to think we we knocked on that door a little bit and got told no, you know, before somebody was able to really kick it in the way he has. But but I really am. I'm proud to know the guy. And, and you know, his story is one that, you know, inspired and motivated me. I, I remember kind of being the bad guy on the scene at one point. You know, I was a bad boy. I never went to prison. I went to jail. <laughs> but being able to tell a, a prison story, I don't have any of those. I've never been. No. But, you know, I, I do think I've – and the more and more I, I got to know him, uh, the more I've learned to respect him and also realize how truly smart the guy is. Hell, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's – it's kind of crazy, and he kind of he kind of came in and fucked the game up because he's he's treating the music business like the street, and they don't know how to handle it. <laughs> and I love that shit. It's like you know, you see him in a conversation, he's just shaking people down, and by the time he's he swept you off your feet, you don't know what happened. He completely disarms you. Absolutely, he just does. It's amazing Absolutely. to watch him work. He's just really good at it. And the thing, you know, when he tested, you know, when he when he spoke the other day, you know, to was it Congress? Or? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I think him and Laney both both were there. Oh my gosh, yeah. man! It was just, you know, it's he, when he takes the mic and and the cameras are on. It's not well, I, you know. I take that back wholeheartedly. Not just when the cameras are on. When he when he gets into a conversation he's passionate about, he kind of turns into a pastor. Oh, I've, I've seen it. You know what Absolutely. I mean? Absolutely, he gets on that box get to preaching. Man. Yeah, oh, but, without a doubt. Yes, he and will. I, you know what? I'm here for it. You know, a lot of the things he has he has to say, you know, I mean, obviously they're, they're opposing points of view, but he definitely... He'll make you think. Yeah, it, it you know, it calls everything into question, and he damn sure he pushed the envelope on, on his side of whatever that argument is. You know, and with him, something I've noticed, too, is, you know, he's taking issue with things that are, that are not so debatable. It's, it's just, this is... You know, when you talk about the opioid crisis or the fentanyl crisis, like, you know, what he said is is coming from a place that he's extremely familiar about. He disarms them completely by saying, I'm not a Democrat or Republican. In fact, my right to vote has been stripped from me because of my past. <laughs> like, that disarm, you just took a gun out of the holster, every single person in that room. Yeah, yeah um, he ain't touring Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Bless his heart. <laughs> you know, I hope he eventually works something out where he can because, I, I, dude, I, I think that that dude's message and that dude's story should be one, you know, that, that should be able to be shared internationally. Absolutely, and you got to respect it. So let's shift gears and let's let's kind of talk more about music. I want to talk about songwriting. I want to talk about show structure. I want to kind of talk about how you have evolved into this place and and what your mental process is about putting a new tour together. Uh, I start off with with songs, man. What's your songwriting approach, man? When you uh, when you're writing, do you write all the time? I mean, I'm not an all the time writer. I got to kind of block other things out. Do you keep ideas back? There's certain people you collaborate with. What's your song approach? Most of the time, I mean, you know how it is. If, if a writer comes out on the road, it, it, you know, there may be an idea. I mean, a fly on the wall could inspire you to write one. Oh, yeah. You know, so I never rule those out. But um, in general, man, I, I'm i not one of those guys that tries to write every day. You know, I found that I, I did for a minute. And I started catching myself um, kind of putting, you know, really solid lines in the songs that, necessarily that weren't necessarily going to be used you know you burn a good line you know and i noticed that you know i realized if i if i keep some of those lines back and just keep them in a the notepad i'm putting together a song full of those lines yeah as opposed to having a couple good lines in a subpar song let's save them and you know when it's time to put together a record you know we got an arsenal in a notepad on my phone i still handwrite a lot of things um but my process, like all of ours, has changed through the years. You know, my first record, I wrote every one of them by myself. Yeah. I didn't know how to co-write, you know. And I came to town to learn that. And, you know, I think all of us kind of find that group that we know we're productive with. I try to branch out every now and then just to, you know, get a different experience and, and kind of tap into a well I hadn't, you know, I hadn't tapped into yet. 
and you know, I learn something every time I write with somebody new. But I, I do have a core group of guys that I, I feel like we're extremely productive. They know me. They know my music. Yeah. You know, and a lot of those guys, even when we're not doing retreats or this, that, and other to to do an album, you know, if they start a song, the guys that I write with on a regular basis, they know I don't I don't want to replace a word. I'm not going to replace one word and put my name on something. Yeah, I get that. You know, I like to. I like to really be able to put my fingerprint on it. So if they get on something they feel like could be something I would cut, they'll call me and be like, hey, you know, we got this so far. you interested in it? And I'll be like, yeah, don't fuck with it anymore. <laughs> you know, yeah. Let me room to, to do my thing and, you know, at least earn my name on the song. Uh, so in the off season, so to speak, that's kind of how we get by. When we kind of set some songs aside. And then when we get ready to do a record, I, you know, I'll have a list. I think this, this last week started with 80-something and whittle down to 50, and then top 50, top 30, top 20. Um, and with the deal I have with my label right now, we're, you know, we had to whittle down to 10, 11. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you kind of, for me, you know, the label's looking more for what could work at radio, you know, what could, what would stream well, what wouldn't. I'm, and, and this is a fault of mine as a businessman, um, but telling my story, in, in my albums being chapters of my life and, and having themes and actually actually saying something is important to me, you know, as, as opposed to having a, you know, a list of 10 or 11 songs that are really, really catchy and clever and all that. I'd rather have several on there. You know, when, when we did this deal, uh, we kind of divided it in half. It's like, you figure out what's commercial, we'll cut those five. Let me tell my story with the other five. And we cut those five yesterday um, and man, I, I, I gotta tell you, there's just something to me when I, I miss the days when, I mean, I'm sure you remember this, but going to stand in line when you knew there was an artist and you were one of them, Absolutely. when you had an album coming out, you had to go to Walmart down the road. I didn't have to go to Best Buy to get yours. You know, if it was parental advisory on it, we had to go to the record shop or Best Buy. I could get yours at Walmart. I remember standing in line when you put an album out. And man, I couldn't wait to get that thing, and I'd live with it, you know. And I mean, the deep deep cuts or, or the B sides, you know, we're putting out records now. If you put out ten, you may be burning eight of them. Yeah, and and I respect exactly what you're saying because I I worry that so many people aren't cutting records. I always went into a project feeling like, you know, I grew up in the area where when I bought a record, I wanted to hear the whole thing. I wanted to listen to it from top to bottom because it wasn't just about one song or going into the next one. It was about the flow. Why did they put that song there? What musicians played on it? I want to see the credits. What studio did they cut in? Who produced it? Who wrote it? Even if the artist didn't write it. I wanted to have all the information. I wanted to understand, you know, it, was this a filler song? Did the label make them? I mean, they were, I was trying to figure all that stuff out. Yeah. And I think nowadays... I, I see a lot of things that are just cut a song at a time. This is, you know, we're just going to, it's, it's just the process has changed. I don't think people are cutting packages. I miss the days of buying albums too. When there was, yeah. there, the artwork was part of the whole process. Absolutely. Well, know, the, it all that's experience. gone. And my kids, man, and uh, how old are your kids right now? Four and six. So they haven't got to this point. You have mine are 20 and 22. But my kids grew up in a generation where they got access to all this stuff in the palm of their hand. And none of it means anything to them. They don't have to anticipate or wait for anything. And even if they do have an artist that they like, if it's two or three years between project, they're so overwhelmed by all the content they have, they really kind of forget about it. Nothing means anything. It's really yeah. a hard thing to, to get through that. And I'm, I hate that about this time and place we live in. It's, man, there, there, there are advantages to it, right? There's, I mean, the rules, a lot of the rules have gone away. Yeah. You, know, you know, I remember going in and cutting albums there was a, there was a time i remember two albums in particular going in and having just some straight rock songs and just some stuff that was really out of the box that, that you know the only thing country about it were, were the lyrics and trying to take those songs and mold them towards what the rest of the album sounded like you know we don't have to do that anymore but i miss being able to tell that story you know i've been asked a couple times people ask me if i'm ever going to write a book you know whether it's about sobriety or just my journey or whatever it's like man i i, I did if you listen, you listen to my to the albums <laughs> yeah i mean that's those are chapters of my life you'll know a hell of a lot about me and what i think about this that and other if you, if you listen to my albums but two you, you said something man 
the you know the B sides or, or the deep cuts, those those were always my. I feel like my favorite songs on an album were always the ones, you know, that you had to get deep into a record to get to. What was the you had so the album that had Texas Tornado on it. You had two singles off of that, right? Uh, Texas Tornado. That was the I See It Now. I had four. I singles See It off, Now. Four singles off that. That had uh, I See It Now. It had If the World Had a Front Porch, it had Any Fool Can See, and Texas Tornado were the singles off four of it. Four singles off one. Front and they were all four number ones. Man, I, I see it now. There was there was one, there was a ballad on that record, though, that I don't think got singled, and I can't remember which one it was. Ballad on that, on that record. Maybe a mid. Uh, but, I, man, I wore that CD out. I mean, straight wore it out. And I was I was always a fan of your voice, but... That that album when you put that one out for whatever reason that that was that was always my favorite. That I see it now song too. Was That's a my favorite bad song of all the stuff that I've done, man. Just the melody and everything about that song. You know, Dan Huff played on that record. Dan, that's Dan. Dude, that's Dan Huff solo on that record. Can we talk about that man for a minute? <laughs> is he not a genius? He's a genius, <laughs> but dude, you know what? That is one of the most genuine humans. Yeah, I've ever. Been. He's just a good soul, man. He, you know. The the last few records we've we've gone a different route. I kind of wanted to try my hand at co-producing and stuff. Yep. Um, you know, but we did several records with Dan, and man, you know, to this day, he every Christmas, every birthday, just randomly in the middle of the week, sometimes he'll he'll write me, you know, a, a long text or it'll be an audio recording. You know, the audio notes you can do now, which I'm a fan of. It's it's yeah. like a you know a sendable version of the next tell chirp. You know, <laughs> um, but he sent me one of those uh, a few weeks ago, man, and it just it warmed my heart. He's just a good human, and I, I got to tell this story, and I've never told this before. But my manager and I were riding around one day, and we we saw Dan, and we didn't have shit to do for a minute, so we were like, "I wonder what Dan Huff does on his day off." And if I'm lying, I'm dying. That Joker went to feed the hungry. By himself, nobody in the car with him. He just pulled up, and, but, and I was like, "That's a different cut of human being. That's just a, that's just a different, it's just a different human." And in this business, I mean, there are good people in it, right? But very seldom do you come across one like that that's just heart and soul solid. Yeah, I love that guy, man, and and still has such a deep seated passion for the music. And when he goes into a project, you can tell that he puts his heart and soul into it. I mean, it's not just going in and cutting some sides and just getting through the project. I mean, it's, he's committed to it. I mean, I mean that's, that's old school. That's old this, school. You know. Absolutely. And sometimes he, he probably uh, pushed you a little harder when he could have probably tuned that line, but he wanted the performance. <laughs> <laughs> so he worked with me before I quit drinking. And uh, he's got, he tells this story, he tells it a lot better than I do, but it was the first time I worked with him. Um, and I, I, I had heard who he was, but to be completely honest with you, man, I, when it came to the music business, not, not that I was necessarily sheltered, but I didn't see many shows, you know, you'll yeah. get in interviews and people ask you, what was, what was the favorite show you ever saw? Well, I don't know from, from the time I was old enough to go to shows, I was playing them. Yeah. You know, every time a door bar door was open, if they give me a stage, I was going to try to make enough to make it to the next town, you know, gas money wise. Um, but he he said so. I had heard of Dan off, and I, I knew you know his discography and, and you know the the genius work that he had done in the past. Um, but I was I was kind of raw in this town, man. It, it, you know, no, nobody really knew how to take me. And this was this is when I was still drinking. So I was I was abrasive as fuck, even when I didn't mean to be. And I was in the I was in the booth, and apparently it, he remembers it a lot better than I do for multiple reasons you know that was i didn't just like drinking there were other things that went with it that you know no memory ain't so great anyway but he uh he said that i walked in the in the booth and sang something and he goes man that was really good that was really good all right sing it again and he said i looked through the thing that took my cans off and set them down and I said, why <laughs> <laughs> and he said it was one of the first times in his career that he was like I, I need to be careful with the way I said you know, like, I come back with it. Wow. <laughs> yeah why 
You, you told me I did a great job. Why well, didn't do it again? You would do a great job twice. You know, so I was totally raw, man, in the studio. So I literally cut my teeth, you know, major production with Dan Huff, and and you know, it's kind of like starting at the finish line. You're tapping it's out like of the way. Gotta kill, killing a 22 point non typical you, when you're 14 years old. Absolutely. What do you do after that? <laughs> Absolutely, man. Yeah. That, and man, just to say, you, you talk about his passion for the music and the record. You know, you see so many guys, and I'm, I'm one of them. I feel like I'm entering the crotchety old man phase of life <laughs> early. You know what I'm saying? Like, I am one step away from screaming at people for driving fast. I already or, did, uh, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, Turn that music down. You know, I'm, I'm one step. I'm, I'm a year away from that. I don't know if it's when you have kids. Like, with every year they get older, you get a little more crusty. I don't know what the deal is. But, uh, yeah, you know, there's so many guys. And, and I, I, I'll i be I'll be the first to tell you, I, I'm not going to bullshit you. There are things that go on. You know, we're talking about a new way of doing things in this business and, you know, the current climate of society. And I am a, a crotchety old man to a certain extent. And, man, it's easy to get bitter you know, in this business and in any, in any other, you know, I've, I've never been one necessarily to, you know, not want good things to happen for people, but damn sure you look at some things that are going on and you're like, damn, man, some bitch, that door I got this, open for I've me. got this plane and the plane's going down and I put people on the son of a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got a handful of people right now that I can name that I want. They're on the plane. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's an ex-wife on there. There's a couple of people that I toured with that are on there. There's some people back home that are on there. Yeah. There's a contractor or two on there. <laughs> There's a special seat for them. There's parties. a special seat for them sons of bitches right there. Well, contractors, some of the sorriest people on the planet. Sorry. For I'm them. telling you, though, <laughs> you know what? To see a guy like Dan... And and this this new way of producing that's coming up where you can do shit you can you can produce an entire song on a laptop. Oh and yeah, these samples sound legitimately real now. Yeah, and to have a guy like Dan is this. I mean, Dan's way of doing things at this point is damn near old school. And you know, and I I I know a lot of people, and and we all do it periodically. And I I still hate it. There's something about getting a full section of musicians in a band, because even if you think if you're producing and you think, I mean, I'll go in when I'm co-producing and doing stuff, and I get it all mapped out in my head. And when those guys get in that room and they start communicating and things happen, it it gets a life of its own. So you're you're hiring people because of what they bring to the table. Absolutely. And and if you just lay a drum track down and an acoustic guitar with a vocal on it and you send it to this one and you send it to this one, you've taken the ability of that song's evolution out of the play, out of play. Absolutely. And I hate seeing that happen. Yeah, I mean, COVID, when COVID happened, we were in the middle of an album. We didn't have any choice but to do that. And, I know. You know, there, there were things that, that turned out that I that I wasn't displeased with, you know, but there is something about, you know, like I said, Dan's way of doing things is almost old school, but it's, it's to me, man, it warms my heart to see that guy work on a project. Cause you know, it fucking matters. Oh, you know, does. that process and every little sound. Yeah. Yeah. We can get it in an app and, and replicate it, but how about we go find the amp in the head and the guitar that makes that sound, you know, and how about we pair it with this, this, this snare drum here, this, that, you know. Back in the day before everything was in a box, and if you were looking for something, I've heard of people going outside and taking hubcaps off of cars to hit them with a drumstick. Just all different manner of things, trying to find those sounds, going through a dozen guitars and just a rack of amps trying to find the worst. And and now, it just because they say everything's in a box, it's just not the same. It's not. It in. It never will be. And, and there's I something there's about something cranking too. an amp to 11. Absolutely. You ain't kidding, buddy. <laughs> getting that air and getting that mic back off of it and getting that tone. You can't get that power without cranking it up. You and there's can't. also something about music and it bringing people together and, and coming together for a common goal, and that is to make that song to play it the best you can. There's, you know, I think that's, that's one of the things that COVID showed me. I, I think we forgot as a society how you know, how much power there is in music and its ability to, to bring us together. You know, because you go out to shows, I mean, there's there's people from the left and right and the middle and different, every shape and color and size and gender, whatever the fuck you want to be today. You know, and they're at the show and they're, they're enjoying music together. Yeah. And that, man, the, the COVID thing happened. I, that was one of the first things I, I noticed was, man, I, like, it does something for me. It does something for me in my heart when, when I go to a show and I see 
you know, people all different shapes and sizes and colors and genders and, and everything, just doing something together, you know, coming and, you know, you may not agree with what the dude's saying on stage. If I'm on stage, there's probably some people from the left that definitely don't fucking agree with what I'm saying, but you know, they're there and, and, and they're doing something and, and enjoying something together, you know? And I, I think that, that, you know, a lot of times for me that comes in the studio when I get in there yesterday, Man, we, we had some new guys on session yesterday that I never worked with. And, man, these dudes are freaking monsters. And to see them get in there together and, and play in a live room, you're right. There's just something that I don't know if you ever be able to put a finger on it or, or define what that actually is. But there's something about, you know, being in the room together. You know, I was watching an interview with Rick Beato. You're familiar with him, Rick Beato? I know the name. You too. So he's a musician West Coast. Anyway, he had uh, Bukovac on, Tom okay. Bukovac. And Buk was talking about how the biggest challenge for him, he said, if you're in the studio and, and you've got a, a master session going on and, and you're you're going through the track and you're coming back and you're playing your solo and you think you've just freaking nailed it and you just, you just freaking killed it. And the producer says... <clears throat> Let's try a different direction. Let's do X, Y, Z. And all of a sudden, you got to back up. you got to change your whole mindset. you got to get your ego and your attitude out of the way. And you got to play the next pass completely different with the same passion and the same intensity that you had with the first time. And might have to do it three or four more times. Absolutely. That's the, the gift of a true, really talented session player. So much of that shit is mental, man. Absolutely. And, and man, you know, session players are a different breed. Oh, without a doubt. You know, man, my guys, you know, I've got a drummer. He's he's my longest standing band member. He's been with me going on twenty years now. And man, this dude like you could take him in the studio and he'd do fine. And and there for a minute, I I remember some of my gang band guys kind of being bent out of shape. We weren't going to the studio, and it was like, man, you guys don't understand. It's just different. These guys get in there and and turn on a dime. It's but it's also in the way they communicate. You know, and eventually, I, yeah, absolutely. And I, I do want to do a record either. If not, not the one after this, the next, um, I do want to cut like a, you know, I had a record called halfway to heaven where we cut it in Athens and we cut it with our guys and it took forever, but it's probably one of my favorite records I ever put out. My first two. So, let's talk about that a little bit because I've I've pondered on that. I, I'm I'm friends with some rock and roll guys. I mean, I know the guys from Three Doors Down. Brad's been a dear friend of mine for a long time, and I remember several years ago they 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 rented Ocean Way for like three months. You know, yeah. Ocean Way's not a cheap studio. No, I, was I mean, say, you somebody forked out some cash. Mm -hmm. So they came in, they sat down. Not only did they rent the studio for three months, they rented a house. None of them lived here at the time, so they rented a house out in Brentwood that they all stayed together. So they were coming to the studio. They were writing in the studio. They were doing all this stuff. And I've I've talked to them about it. How different is that? I mean, because I've heard of, you know, guys like Motley Crue having to bring, like, a guitar player in to help you navigate through uh, leading you through the guitar passes and helping Nikki Six learn how to play the fucking bass. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, all that stuff. So how, Can you imagine I, having that job? Oh, my oh, God. <laughs> that would suck, but man. but I'm just saying, going through the process, it takes so much longer. And I've heard of them playing tracks 30, 40 times, Absolutely. and continuing to evolve it to work out a dynamic or get a keep searching for a guitar tone. And in that world, you all go down together. Oh, absolutely. That's the way it is. And and the process that we have where we all go in and we write in advance and we get all these things mapped out. A lot of times you go in the demo room, you demo something on a cheap scale just to kind of get the pieces mapped out. By the time you go in with the A-team, you can cut six songs in two sessions if you're real efficient and then Absolutely. come in and do vocals for two days and you're done. Yeah, we did five yesterday. Yeah, today. I'm, I mean, five, six songs is not unreasonable in a two, in a, a ten and a two, baby. Yeah, that, that wasn't happening back then. On, uh -huh. on that record, it was, man, you know what? But I feel like you can hear it. And there are little imperfections in there. There are things we didn't iron out. And I, I think they're as cool as the things we did. Is You know, there's something about them old records, man, when you hear string slides and stuff, and all those imperfections yeah. that we pull out now, there's just an authenticity there that it, it's when you hear the breath of a vocal, exactly when just the 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 air on the bow of an instrument. I, I you know I use fiddle a lot still, but there's something about that a fiddle is kind of like you got to treat it like a vocal. It's got to breathe, and if you squish it down too much, everything's just so 
something. Yeah, it's a computer program. So when you when you approach putting your show together, say you're working on a new album, and and I, and I'm sure you think about this to some degree. You know, you write a whole bunch of stuff, and as it all starts to wrestle down to that 10, 11 songs, it's like, I got a spot in the show for this one. I don't have this groove. I don't have this tempo. As you start to wrestle that stuff down, do you write? leading to that place uh, do you are you looking to fill certain gaps or, or make evolutionary changes in the show i mean do you think about that stuff when you're going in the studio too i do we, we try to approach it where you know if there's there's a vibe we need for the show say there's a song that i mean and and you know this as good as anybody there's a difference you know even if a song goes number one it doesn't necessarily mean it's an impact record amen brother impactful enough to keep playing for 10 years and people still give a shit. That's right. You know what I mean? So it's like, we had that conversation yesterday. It was like, you know, I had a couple, I, for the first time I have a band that, that, um, this is the second show they've come in where it's, you know, the band leaders came, I've got two band leaders. They came to me and said, Hey man, will you give us a shot at putting the set list together? And my first response is in my head. It's like, hell no. Are you off your fucking rocker? Like, I've been doing this 20, wow. no, you know. But honestly, it, you know, I I lived with it and thought about it. And I was like, you know what? Give it a shot. It, I got to try new stuff. I'm old and crusty. Like, I, you know, I, I'm just ornery. I need to try new stuff. Yeah, give it a shot. And honestly, you know, they did some things. I remember going in, had my gun loaded, you know, just thinking I was about to shoot everything down and hearing some things and being like, okay, that works. And I never would have thought to do that. Um, so I've been more open-minded on that end, but you know, as, as far as when it, when it comes to a record, this one in particular, we have a song called off the rails. It'll be the first release off the album and there's no intentions to hit going to radio. Yeah. There's no intentions of doing anything outside of it being the tours, the off the rails tour and the song's called off the rails. And it's, it's it's a banger, man. It's a show opener. We needed a show opener. We've been opening a show with, with you know, went through a went through two tours now where we've been opening with kicking in the sticks because we kind of let the show tell a story. It was almost chronological, you know, where you could hear, you know, we start the show with a lot of stuff from the beginning and we trickle yeah. some newer stuff in, just you know, but in large part, it was like you know, there were several years where, you know, the set kind of would go through almost in order chronologically of, of kind of the evolution of our music and, and yeah. kind of tell a story in itself. But, you know, we're kind of getting away from that, letting a little more ebb and flow and, and, you know, I'm in a different chapter of my career, man. And, and, you know, I'm in a spot where, and, and I'm sure you can relate to this. I'm in a spot where I have songs that four or five years ago, I could have played twice in the set list and they'd have been right on board with it. That now, you're lucky to get a verse chorus in without losing some folks. Yeah, you know what I mean. And we we've kind of adjusted our, you know, we we've taken a new approach the last two years. When we went out, we did a Nickelback tour last year. It was a sixty minute set, and we were trying to whittle down songs. And I was like, man, I don't want to lose that song out of the set. And we kind of got to the point where it's a totally new approach for us, but man, it's worked really well. It worked insanely well on that tour. Instead of taking the, the song out of the set list, what if you verse chorus it? You know, what if you go in, hit a verse chorus, solo, hit that chorus again, and, you know, transition into another one? So, you know, our goal for this, this is our, this will be the first time we've tried it as a headliner this year. Um, you know, where it's 90 minutes wide ass open like that. Yeah. But, you know, it kind of gives you an opportunity. You know, you're not playing three and a half, four and a half minute songs. You're verse coursing and out, but you, it gives us an opportunity to kind of work some covers in to re engage people that we may have lost here, there. And you kind of sneak some new stuff in and get away with it. You know, and, and that's a, that's a pretty notable thing to pay attention to. We live in a culture now where the attention span is definitely a lot shorter. Very, very short. I mean, if you're if you're watching TikTok, <laughs> yeah, I, I particularly like like to do things on YouTube where I'm watching an hour. I'm, I don't. Joe Rogan can be a little long winded with a three hour podcast and stuff, but yeah. about an hour, hour and a half. You know, I, I like to listen to that stuff. But some that I had, I really had to stop watching TikTok. I had to because it just it just 
it shortens that shit up. I take I go one month on and two months off uh, with those platforms and. They don't give me my password to Instagram. <laughs> Anytime one of my buddies sends me like a link to Instagram thing, I'm like, I can't fucking watch it, dude. I, you know what I mean? Because I know me well enough to know. I don't spend much time in comment sections. Because when I do, I read them. And it's it's not like it deep seat bothers me. Because at the end of the day, it, unless you're willing to say it right here, there ain't much value to it. You know, but if somebody gets on there and says something about, Somebody I care about. They can talk shit about me all day long, but I get on there and somebody says something about somebody I care about. Yeah, I start wondering who, you know, Cod Chaser 556 is. You know what I'm saying? You start <laughs> figuring how out close they live to me. Yeah, I start thinking about calling my Navy SEAL buddies. Like, can y'all track this motherfucker down? I just want to see if he'll say it to me. You know Rogan, I mean? Rogan says you got to post and ghost. You just throw something up there and it just... Don't go back. Don't read. The don't comments. go back and look at. Get it. out of it, dude. Yeah. I was I was just got off the country music cruise and and spent a week on there. And my mom had my mom with me. And it was she's eighty, so it was great spending time with her. And she met this woman. I had done my show on Tuesday night, and then I had my sleeves rolled up. Of course, I'm I love my ink man. It's body art. I'm kind of passionate about all this stuff. And she came up to me and she said, "I really wish you would uh, like when you do your show. Would you roll your sleeves down so we don't have to look at that?" I said. It's my skin. Yeah, I really, I'm telling you, she really did. I had another woman came up to my wife and looked right at her and said, you look really high maintenance. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm not. What the hell's going on on this cruise <laughs> ship, bro? It's brutal I, I, honesty. I was, I, I just laughed, but I, I was real calm. My wife laughed at me when the woman walked out. I said, you know what? It's that is social thing. media in the wild. It's, it's, <laughs> it's feral. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> so let's talk about the ink, man. I, I, yeah. I, so Bubba Irwin is working on this arm. You know Bubba? No, I know the name. Aldean hooked me up with Bubba, man. So this was something that I've wanted to do for a long time. And I know we were talking about a little ink before. And uh, this is one of my favorites. Uh, Travis Harper from Idaho, my guitar player, hooked me up with Travis. This is my country music Mount Rushmore. And I thought uh, long and hard about this. So it's got George Strait, Merle Haggard, Keith Whitley, I mean, George Strait, George Jones, Keith Whitley, and Merle Haggard. Oh, so oh. tell me your music, Mount Rushmore. Man, music, Mount Rushmore is tough for me. I'd and it's not just Skinner country. I mean, it's your thing. Yeah, I'd have to put Skinner up there. Okay. Um, there was something about listening to a Skinner record. Man, when I was a kid, my parents had that. Granted, I, I had a wreck after high school that I hit my head pretty hard. I don't remember a lot of my childhood. Um, but I do remember for whatever reason that my parents had, it was like a box of tapes, like cassette tapes. And I had a little Walkman and I finally, you know, technology moved ahead a little bit and they put that Walkman out that you could hit it and it wouldn't stop the tape. Yeah. Make it skip. And buddy, dude, I could tote that thing on my bicycle. And I remember just riding around listening to a little bit of everything. And, uh, I'll, I'll never forget finding the Skinner record. And be like, man, now we're talking like them. Oh, that's something different. And, yeah. you know, they were talking about things that I understood uh, in a completely different chapter of life. Like, as a, as a young kid, you know, hearing that stuff was like, I could still relate to it. And it was, you know, I'll never forget that feeling. It just, you listen to a Skinner record, man, it feels like home. You know, there was something comforting about it for sure, man. And, you know, like, uh, 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 it's not just Sweet Home Alabama, but a lot of the B-sides, like uh, Curtis Lowe, a lot of those old cultural things, man. That was just, I mean, it was just honest and it was raw. Ronnie was a badass. Yeah. Ronnie Van Zandt was a badass, man. Oh, uh, man, I, you know, and I got to say, Gary was one of my favorite humans. We got a chance to do uh, CMT Crossroads with him. Yeah. And it was, Johnny, Johnny's a badass, too. I love Johnny. Yeah. I've spent a lot of time with him over the years, man. He's a good dude. I like Johnny. Yeah. But, you know. Uh, they said man, Ronnie was intense, man. Oh, you was serious about his shit. Oh, yeah. I remember having a conversation with Gary about that. It was like, you know, man, when, when Gary passed away, that was, that was, that was, uh, that was kind of a gut check moment. We, you know, what impressed me about them as much as anything, especially him, was when we did that thing, I, I take a lot of pride in, in what it took us 20 years to build I had, dude just some amazing people god bless with me bless me with and put in my life that they helped me create this thing that shouldn't have happened right and you know when we show up a lot of times like i can tell you 
Toby Keith was one of these. Tim McGraw was one of these. Um, but I remember not knowing what to think, you know, how, how Johnny was going to be, or how Gary was going to be. And getting in there, and, man, they treated not just my band, but my crew the same way they did me. And that I'll never forget that as long as I live. That yeah. meant the freaking world to me, man. Um, you know, there's there's just something about it. It's just different. And you can tell, like, that's that's not a new thing. That's that's, that's something. Where they are. Yeah, that that had to be from the ground up. That yeah. never changed. You know what I mean? So we all have. I feel like we all have some some negative touring experiences where you're like, man, yeah, I'm never doing that to somebody. You know. But oh yeah. <laughs> it's uh. But yeah, I'd, I'd have to say they they'd have to be on it. I'd have to put most Zephyrus on there just because. I just love everything about him. It, Rhett Aikens has one of the best Hank Jr. stories of all time, and I'd, I'd have to let him tell it. But. You know the 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 summary of it, the the quick the long short of it was, you know if you met if you met Hank Jr. and he wasn't that wasn't an asshole, <laughs> I'd be disappointed. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like if I meet this guy and he comes up, and he's like, "Hey, nice to meet you." You know, I'd be really glad to have you. I think I would be disappointed. Yeah. Like if he comes up and he was like, "Who the fuck is this guy?" Was you know? Okay, there we go. You know what I mean? Like it's, it, the, just the ultimate, you know, double finger to the world. And honestly, I'm I'm here for the stage meltdowns too. That shit's entertaining. You know that that recording they finally put out on YouTube where he goes off on everybody, Garth and Oh, that was that was the Kansas City. I was like, oh, oh yeah, holy yeah, shit. that's hey, this is great, oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's fucking, oh. This is gold, <laughs> that's, man. Shit, if I if I had about Rush before, I might put them two on there just twice. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's just be my story. It'd be like everybody else can fuck off. It's hard. To, it's hard to touch those two. Uh, but yeah, man. I you know we actually got a few shows with him this year. And I'm I'm really excited about it. One of them is literally on my wedding anniversary. It popped up, and it, you know this will be our nine year. And uh, I, I called my wife and I said, "Hey, so uh, a show, uh, an opportunity popped up on on our wedding anniversary." And she was like, "Well, you know," and that's something we're we're pretty, you know, we're pretty old school about that. We try to be intentional about. Yeah, you know, you know, birthdays, you know, anniversaries, things like that. We're we're pretty strict on not, you know, having my job step on that because so long, for so long, you know, that this has never been a job for us. It's life, you know what I mean. And and our lives kind of have to revolve around a career. So we yeah. we, we make a, con a conscious effort to, you know, not let my job step on everything and. You know, it's kind of an unspoken rule. I try not to do things on birthdays or, or you know, wedding anniversaries. And but when that one popped up, I got called and I said, "Hey, I'm gonna have I'm I there's something that popped up that I got to do." And she was like, "On our anniversary?" And I was like, "Yeah, but baby, it, it's it's Hank Junior." You know, and she was like. <laughs> You know what about my wife? She knows me well enough to know that she never once contested it. She was like. Good woman. Okay, well, we'll work around it. You know, she, she did, I didn't even have to fight for it. I was like, yeah, that's, that's a good woman, man. Damn right. That's baby. a good woman. But it's both safest, baby. Yeah, but, I mean, hey, well, you know, but, you know, it's. I'd have to say, yeah, Skinner, both safest for sure. Cash would have to be on it. Um, I wear all black for a reason, a couple different reasons. One, I had this manager that was a real piece of shit, and he wore all black all the time. When we split, went in our different ways, like, I wanted to take who he was. So, <laughs> you sucked the soul out of him. I'm telling you what. People ask why I've been wearing a black hat for 20 years. I ain't shooting you at all. I'm petty like that, bro. Like, <laughs> you no longer have an identity. Oh. <laughs> I, I know that's some rancid shit. I'm well aware. This dude, this dude did some fucked up shit. So awesome. he deserved it. But yeah, I'd have to put cash up there. Just man, for the obvious reasons. But but also, man, I, I remember not just seeing that movie, but hearing stories about him and, and the man he was. I was always inspired by, you know, that that kind of just tortured soul aspect of him. Oh, yeah. You know, it was like the, he went deep before it was cool to go dark and deep. 
you know, and, and you know, he's so outside the box. And, dude, honestly, I, I think I'd have to put Elvis up there. I'd probably be my fourth. Very cool. Um, Just because, you know, man, I, I have a – I have a deep appreciation for those who are willing to go against the grain and, and do shit you ain't supposed to. And, and, you know, I just have a soft spot in my heart for guys like that. And he was, you know, that was another one of the ultimate guys. It was just kind of like, I loved in that movie. I keep up well. It was pr pretty decent. Like, you know, we've been to Graceland and, and been to see the original home site Memphis and stuff. And, you know, it was just, he did something so different. Than anything that was going it on, shook the whole country, man. Right, and it shook it up, man. And it changed it. Yes, to this day, it's yes. different because of that guy. And you know, you can't help but respect it. I listen back to a lot of music, and for me, it's just as much about who he was and the way he went about things as it, as it was the music. Music was cool, but man, like watching that movie where when that cop told him, "If you so much as wiggle a finger." You're going to jail. And he looked at him. And they said that was one thing. I talked to a guy that uh, was pretty close to the situation. He was like, no, that was that was a real thing. Oh, shit. He looked over at him. He was like. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked still with his finger like I was. That's the ultimate to me. So, yeah, I get, that's a crazy route, Mount Rushmore. But but that would be like it. it man. Talking about tattoos, man, I'm pretty excited. We uh, This album we're working on, the, the title track of the album. Um, all of my albums from day one. Be that a faith based spiritual, you know, title. Yeah. This will be the first that on surface isn't. Now, it'll be, you know, the cover will be either my cross here or my cross here. Um, but it's, it's going to be called Tattoos. And it, it, there's a song that goes with it that uh, is pretty much the theme of the record and the, the title track and the whole thing. Um, there's some interest in, in taking it to country radio. I'm hesitant because it's a little outside the box, but it's the first time I've heard a tattoo song that doesn't suck. Yeah. It's, as a guy with tattoos, you know, a lot of times when you hear a song about tattoos, it's, you know, the vibe behind it or the message behind it is, look at my cool tattoos. If you talk to a real tattoo person, there's stories. There are yeah. things that matter to us, man. And, and a lot of mine, I mean, I, I'm literally covered from, when I say head to toe, head to toe. Um, no, my neck's open and my face, I hadn't gone there. And I, I don't really plan on going to my face. It's just yeah, something about that, that, you know. Yeah. My mama might disown me. She's, she's, she has to swallow a whole lot of this. She hates it all. And yeah. I keep trying to tell her, I said, it's, it's a personal thing. It's, it's art to me. And they reflect a time or a place or a situation or some travel experience or something that they, they're special to me in each one of them for their own reason. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's uh, and that's kind of what the song talks about. It's like you know, a lot of mine, I, I have respect on my chest. And when I got it, it I got it for a different reason. You know, it was kind of, it was a little gangster. I ain't gonna lie to you, but you know, it, but but now when I see it, you know, if I get out of the shower and I catch it in the mirror, it's like, hey man, it reminds me like, make a conscious effort to, to show people respect. You know, until they give you a reason not to. You know, because I'm I'm a little bit of a hothead. And, uh, no stranger to confrontation. To be honest with you, I don't mind it much. <laughs> Especially as I get older in age, I'm sitting here talking like I'm 97 years old, but <laughs> I just turned 39 and I, I feel like I'm in my 70s, dude. I'm not kidding at all. I just turned 37, man. So I'm I'm right on the you right on the saying? rise of that. Man. Dude, I'm getting the crotchety old man thing's a real deal. But I think that's just a whole lot of don't give a shit. Yeah, okay. yeah, Fun. yeah. Where it's uh, like, I think there's a the place that you get to in life where you just get kind of comfortable with yourself and you say, you know what, I'm good with me. Whether you like me or not, I really don't give a shit. That's a real thing. Yeah. I'm not afraid to be wrong anymore. No, and that's part of the journey, man. If I'm wrong and, and I know it, I, I don't have a problem admitting that I'm wrong. I don't have a problem saying I'm sorry. That's the last five years for me that that has been a real change. And I don't know if that come, you know, I got a four-year-old and a six-year-old. Maybe that came... Maybe it came they with being a dad. You yeah. know what I mean? But it's it's like, you know, I will say my wife kind of gets the worst of it sometimes. I really don't like losing arguments with my wife. I that just, you know, but, you know, the last five or six years I haven't minded it as much. And, and yeah, you know, I said that in joking mostly, but there's, there's some value to it too. My wife's extremely smart and she's right about shit a lot. 
and, yeah. and you know, you know, marriage is marriage, man. We're gonna argue. We're gonna see oh, yeah. things differently from time to time. And I, I just, I just want to be right every now and then. Well, her, I think it still matters at home. You know what I mean? I don't know if it's you know the, the kids are in there. Yeah, I got to be right in front of somebody. But um, I, I actually am in a chapter in my life where I'm I'm okay being wrong. You know, I, I'm cool with learning stuff. The older I get, the less I realize I know. I used to think I knew everything. When I was young, I thought I knew everything. In my 20s, drinking and filled oh, up and everything yeah. else, I thought I had the answer. But I tell my kids all the time, I said, y'all think y'all know everything. When I was your age, I did. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Without a doubt. What well, nothing I didn't know. But, but yeah, isn't it? That, man, this crazy, beautiful, fucked up, dark, awesome, terrible thing called life is just, man that little four-year-old and that little six-year-old have a way of reminding me how complicated and how simple it is all at the same time. Just all that innocence, man. And and one of the things with all the crap going on in the world, my goal as a parent was to try to protect that innocence as long as I could. Yeah. And I think as, as and with all the, the, just the sexual violence and the pedophilia and the crap that's just everywhere you turn. When did we fall? When when did when did we go there? Because the innocence of a child to me is the most precious thing you have. Because the longer they can hold on to it, and the longer you can protect them, the better off their life's going to be. Absolutely, and I, I mean, I do believe in exposure. And I, Absolutely, I'm, I'm aware with you know with my kids. I'm going to have to have some conversations with my kids before. Certain conversations with my kids before most parents, because the minute they're old enough to read or understand a story, they're gonna be like, "Dad, what's rehab? <laughs> and why'd you go?" <laughs> and, and, and if yours are like mine, they're gonna look up everything about you. Yeah, they're gonna know. Th they're gonna find things that you would just assume would be buried, but the internet's there and it's forever. Yeah, they're, they're gonna find it all. And you know what? I've, I've kind of made peace with it. And my son the other day, we got pulled over. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, so the jail conversation came up at you know at uh at dinner for whatever reason I can't, I can't remember something about being pulled over, but somehow it transitioned into jail. And he was like, you know, and I was telling him like jail's not somewhere you want to go, buddy. Like it's not fun. Or any stuff. He was like, Daddy, have you been to jail? And it kind of took my wife by surprise. But man, I've kind of got some of these conversations preconceived. He's like, I didn't miss a beat. He's like, Daddy, have you ever been to jail? Yeah, buddy. I have, more than once. You know, and the reason why is is the story for later in your life. But just know it's not somewhere you want to go. And I'm going to do my best to raise you in a way that kind of leads you away from it. But you know what? I heard something the other day that somebody said that, you know, we take too much credit for, you know, the way our children are going to turn out. Like they're born with their personality, and they, you know, God has a predetermined, you know, plan for them. Yep. You know, the, obviously the freedom of choice is still there, uh, and the freedom to make decisions. You know, whether or not they're, you know, God's intentions for you or their own thing. Um, but I, I do think it's our job to give them that foundation, right? And at least, you know, when they take their first couple steps, like, but at least be pointing them. Not off a cliff, <laughs> or at least, at least like like the bowling lanes that the, when you put the bumpers up on the side of the bowling alleys, when they just be there to kind of lightly nudge them back. I into like the lane. that. Just, I like that. That's that's the way I always looked at. It. Just, put, yeah. just be the bumpers, man. Don't don't force them here. Just kind of bump them back in line. It is it is wild to me though. But you know, with my wife, I, I can honestly say the first time they heard and repeated. Cuss words was not my fault, which was actually very surprising, you know. But you know, I, I don't want my kids to be to be sheltered. I don't want them to be gun shy. If somebody says a cuss word in front of them, like I don't want them wincing or anything like that. Like, uh, which is one of the main things, man. When when some of this stuff, you know, you were talking about earlier, you know, about protecting our kids, right? Like, there's a thing called the Warrior Poet Society in in the sky on there is like a platform. It's really cool. Like I, I'm into guns and stuff. So it's, there's a lot of gun training and stuff on there, but, um, there's also a thing called the rule. Of, I think it's the rule of man. Um, I, th I think that's what it's called, but I can't remember the guy's name. Exactly. John Lovell's the guy that, that kind of runs it and stuff. But, uh, th there's a lot of stuff on there about parenting, um, which is really cool to me because there's, you know, you can find parenting books for, 
but not necessarily for our way of thinking. Yeah. True. You know what I'm saying? Where, where you're raising, I'm not raising a little boy, and, and I'm not necessarily raising a man. I'm trying to raise a king. I want to raise somebody. In our society these days, I feel like we need to raise leaders. You know, there's there's something about having the capacity to be led by God and God only. You know what I mean? And outside of that, like, I want my son to be the person that kind of takes the reins in the situation. And and, and we're in a society where we're de being demasculated all the freaking time. Buddy, I'm telling you, it, it's it's wild to me. So much so, and, and my wife is, is more than on board with this. To be honest with you, my wife came to me a few years ago. And, uh, you know, it's when, you know, we're watching. I think it, <laughs> one of the conversations it came from is, you know, somebody sent me a video from social media. You know, I get them in text. I can watch them on my text. But uh, this guy that went to a school board meeting with this book that, you know, his kid had got from the library and then sent me another one where, you know, a teacher had done something, you know, exposed the kid to something at a very young age that the, the father didn't think was appropriate. And I told my wife, I said, look, you know me and you know my temperament. If I go to a school board meeting, it ain't going to be to talk to nobody. You know, it's because I know there's a few of them in the same fucking place at the same time. <laughs> We're we going to have a conversation. But um, more than that, so my wife came to me and she said, you know, with, with some of the things going on in, in public school, um, you know, I just, we felt like they were, they were being, and again, I, I believe in exposure. But I think there's there's a time, and, and you know, you talk about protecting innocence. Like we're exposed, these there's some folks exposing kids to some pretty wild shit. It's called grooming. Yeah, right. It's a bunch of crap. So she comes to me with this this idea, and you know she had researched it and done a lot of homework on it, and it's like a it's like a homeschool school, like we a micro homeschool school. ours. Uh, yeah. When they got to about fifth grade, we pulled them out of school. See, I was dead set against it. I did but, but when I grew up, homeschool kids were like uh, either Christian nutbags. You know, they were they were really weird. They were unsocialized. Things are different now. I mean, yeah. you have a lot of resources. When we left, we took our kids out of school. We left with a group of about five families, and that's the first year or so we had this collective group. And one was a, an old English teacher, and she knew Spanish. My wife was a nurse. We had people that have different disciplines, and so we kind of collectively did that. And then we found another situation where they went to a, a church where they actually went to class on Friday, and then they had access to sports and different things, but they did most of their studies and curriculum at home throughout the week. And then nice. so it was, it was, there's some different things out there now that make it much more appealing. You don't have to deal with that crap. Yeah. She came to me, and I, I'm, I'm just to be completely transparent and honest, like I, I really wasn't hearing it. I was stubborn enough to be like, nope, nope. They can go to school where I went to school or where you went to school. You know, she went to Commerce, I went to Jefferson. My wife and I have a long history. We went about six, seven years without seeing or speaking to each other. Uh, but we had a past before that. I met her. I was working on some community service hours at a church. And and uh, that was the church her family went to. And, um, but, you know, I was she went, that, we, that was the most heated rivalry in the state of Georgia when it came to single A football. You weren't allowed to date across the river. You know, but I, I kind of came to terms with it. I was like, listen, you know, our school, the school I went to, I graduated with 66. Now there's 66 in one classroom. You know, yeah. it blew up. Commerce is still uh, small considering. Um, I said, they can go to where I went to school or where you went to school. If I could wrap my mind around that, you know, but we're not doing any of that. Our kids aren't going to be socially awkward. We're not doing that. And to be honest with you, you know, watching a couple of those videos and then the Uvalde thing in particular, um, you know, we're wondering why these these schools are getting hit, man. It's like, you know, not to, not to get into a gun conversation, but, you know, it's a soft target. You, you got a couple police resource officers at the very most. Like, it's easier to get in a school than it's than it is to get on a plane. Oh, yeah. I, I didn't like that concept. I didn't like, you know, I didn't agree with a lot of what, you know, these schools are exposing these kids to. And when the Uvalde thing happened, I, I really did. I was like, you know what, let's let's have the conversation. And she 
I got to give her all the credit in the world. I had a couple things. I was like, I, I'm cool with it, but they're going to have to spend some time outside learning how to do shit that's self-sustaining. They need to learn how to plant things that, you know, they can eat if they need to. They need to learn how to fish. You know, they need to learn how to hunt, you know, at some point. Maybe we can't teach kids hunting quite yet. But, you know what I mean? Like, I ain't let with my own. But, you know, as far as, like, planting stuff, fishing, like, I feel like that's important. And I, I said, and also, you know, I want them to learn history. I have a 16-year-old godson that didn't know who Hitler was. Like, you know, history repeats itself in the worst way, you know, especially if we're ignorant to it. You know, it's like... We're really concerned about showing these kids, exposing these kids on, you know, algorithms that are literally built to kind of make you a sheep. I don't, I don't, I don't like that train of thought at all. You know? Well, they're not. They're they're being programmed. They're not being taught. They're being programmed yeah. because they're not being educated in a way that promotes independent thought and and rationalization and and problem solving and those things that that's what's being taken out of the school in a large chunk yeah born into conflict yeah. we're, we're, we'll teach you real quick how to argue oh yeah you know what i mean we'll teach you real quick how to walk out when something you don't need you don't even understand is going on you know so she she brought the idea to the table and and man now uh we're in her first year she picked up several more kids for uh, the second semester but she started this thing called Art Learning Academy. It's faith based. It's it's like a micro school, kind of like yeah. a homeschool school. Um, I mean, I'm not gonna lie to you. I sent the teachers to to pistol training. <laughs> you know, if, if that's that's one school, somebody shows up to hit it. I don't know if they're gonna hit anybody. But they're gonna get shot back at at least, at the very least. You know, <laughs> exactly. But you know, um, she, she I, I have to give her a, a ton of credit, man. Um, my wife's an extremely faithful woman, um, but she's she's an incredible mom, and she she decided to do something and took off with it. And man, it it really is like some of these kids. It's the first time I've ever heard of kids crying because they didn't get to go to school you know, on a certain day. I was quite the opposite. Man, I was trying to dodge that motherfucker every time I got a chance, bro. If I could have been sick every day, I would have been, you know. But uh, you know it's. It was it was kind of going out on a limb, and I know there's a lot of folks probably listening to this, but, you know, they won't agree with that, and that's 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 fine. Somebody disagree with me doesn't doesn't bother me at all. But you know, I, I can honestly say that you know that school's something that's I feel like it's a service to the community. Yeah, it's like you know, we're giving kids a safe place to go learn, and also it's it's like a, and there are other positive things to it too, like the classroom sizes being so small, you know. She did some research. Was explaining to me that it's it's you know a lot of these schools, you, you got people that are that are way ahead and people that are way way behind. And, and they not, pull the head back because instead of removing the way behind and giving them or putting a class back or whatever, they pull everybody back. They yeah. they don't reward you for excelling. They yeah. penalize you and drag you back to wait on everybody else. Yeah, and, and you know what? It's it you know when we looked into it, it's not necessarily. On the teacher, because the teacher has to teach the curriculum and, and to the to the large part of the class. It's like, you know, with a smaller class size, you know, they're able to be more direct and, and you know, have a, a more one-on-one -on -one approach and, and kind of keep them right there together. It's not so much, you know, about, you know, the kid having a learning disability. It's just being able to cater to the way they do learn. And everybody learns different. Yeah, yeah absolutely. We all do. So it's man, it's been something I'm, I'm extremely proud of her for, and you know, I know a lot of people look at it and go, you know, they're, you know, we're, but anyway, it's it's something I'm I'm extremely proud of her for, and and I, I truly do believe, you know, now it's just it's not just our household, like we're kind of taking that that mentality into our community, and you know, the church that my wife got me back in the church here recently. Um, we actually, you know, I went and I kind of had my feelings about it, you know, but it's, I can honestly say that, that I've seen some positive changes in my life and, and I, I've, I'm to the point now where I don't mind going at all and I actually stay awake and everything <laughs> for the most part. 
dude, I, I, it's it's amazing to hear your journey and where you've kind of come to after all you've been through. I have much respect for you for your career, the man that you are, mm-hmm. and I and I appreciate the candid conversation, man. I've really enjoyed this today. It's really a pleasure. Absolutely, you, man. man. Boys, y'all got any questions before we get out of here? I know they all they always got something. Don't be Scott, shy. Scott, Scott, Scott works on a question leading up to these things. Uh, well, this one this one's kind of weird, but oh, come okay. On, if you're, if you're in two lanes, you're going that way, and you get a sign that says one your lane's ending. Do you move over quickly, or do you go on to the end and then work your way in? Zip her in, as they say. I think it depends on what's beside me. You know, if it's a fucking 18-wheeler with a bunch of pipe on the back of it, I may let him go on ahead. You know what I mean? That, it might if depend on what you're driving, too. Subaru, she might have to eat some decent gas. Right? You know what I'm saying? I like it. I got a train horn on my new truck. Bro. I'm excited really? about it. It's freaking awesome. It's already got me in trouble, but it's awesome. I've seen that thing scare the shit out of people. Dude. Lord have mercy. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome. I'm going to recycle one. This, this is pretty good. So uh, what's an insult? Let me tell you my, my answer first. But what's an insult that you've received that you're the most proud of? So our band leader told me that I tune like old people fuck. So I'm assuming he means slowly and with precision. But, <laughs> so, <laughs> Damn, I ain't got one that can touch that shit, bro. You've had a minute to think about this. Shit. It's unfair. All right, so check this. That, that Hank Jr. show where he's all hammered drunk. So my favorite line from that would be that South Alabama to South Alabama, something, something, something. Who gives a shit, land? So, <laughs> so, so what would be your favorite line from that if you can think of one? The Garth part? Yeah, bro. <laughs> here's the thing. I'm a Garth Brooks fan. Like Garth has some shit. There's no denying Garth Brooks or the talent that man had. But just the pure fucking nutsack on that guy and the audacity to go, oh. <laughs> I, I, you you <laughs> <laughs> like, dude, I remember hearing that be like, holy shit. <laughs> like, just that is, oh my, that's a whole other level, bro. And he don't give a shit. I mean, and I love that, dude. What the, who falls off a fucking mountain, destroys their whole fucking head, <laughs> and then comes back and still takes the world over? You know what I mean? There's, oh, there's just so much about that dude that I want to learn. Well, that Red Aiken story is so funny. It's like, you'd have to hear Red tell it, but he said it. he got Hank's number, and that was, man, he said it was, man, one of the coolest things that ever happened to me. I got Hank's number, and, you know, I I, I wasn't going to call him. And, you know, I just, it was just having it was the coolest thing ever. He said, but I got to drinking one night. Me and, me and a couple of buddies was out riding around listening to them, Hank Jr. on the radio, and he said, I got up to drunken courage to call him. He said he called him and he said he, he Hello. He said, Hank, it's 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 Red Akins. I got your number all night. He said, Who? <laughs> <laughs> he said, Red Akins. It doesn't matter, man. I just man, do you know how many people or riding around listening to your songs on dirt roads right now. He said, he goes, millions, brother. <laughs> <laughs> and hung up on him. <laughs> millions, millions, brother. <laughs> Dude, I, I'm telling you, man, that's a fucking trip. Yeah, I, I don't, I, I, I can't even touch that. I don't know the answer to your question. I think that's where we have to end the show, boys. <laughs> Dude, I'm telling you, man. Brother, it's been a pleasure. The pleasure's all mine, man. I'm telling you, that, like, you and 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 I mean this. I'm not just saying this because I'm I'm in your house talking to you, man. You uh, you your your time. You came up amongst monsters, man, and not only held your own, but but did amazing things for the genre. And you know, you got some of my favorite songs of all time. So, man, to be able to sit down and have a conversation with you, and for y'all to think to have me and invite me man this is uh it's something i'll never forget brother i appreciate you more than you know i hope we get to share the stage somewhere along the way in the near let's future let's do it and uh at some point let's sit down and do this again my friend i'm all and the way i will in. call you a friend from now on out man uh, you I, and me both much respect brother yeah. brantley gilbert yeah. Come, baby.